thank you very much. Uh, remember that a beta polytope is defined in the following way. We take n random points in the d-dimensional space, and the density of these points is 1 minus x squared to the power beta for x smaller than 1. And the beta polytope is defined as the convex hull of these points. For example, the points may be uniformly distributed on the unit ball. And our goal is to compute the expected number of k-dimensional faces of this convex hull, to compute it exactly. Now, in this lecture, we, it, it will be not possible to obtain a final formula, but what we shall do is a reduction of this problem to the problem of computing certain random angles. So the goal today is to reduce the computation of the expected number of phases to the computation of certain expected angles of simplices. Now, to do this, we need to introduce some notions. More precisely, we need to introduce the conic intrinsic volumes. So let us start with definitions. A polyhedral cone, or just a cone, is defined as a positive hull of finitely many vectors. So it is a positive hull of finitely many vectors v1, v say n. And remember that the positive hull is defined as the set of all combinations of these vectors with non-negative coefficients. Here v1 and so on vn are some fixed vectors in R. So uh, Polyhedral cone is just a positive hull, and one can also define the notion of the dual cone is defined as follows: C dual is the set of all y in R v, such that the product, the scalar product of y with any x, is smaller than zero for every x in C. But instead of requiring it to be negative or non-positive for every x in C, it is, of course, possible to take here x equal to v1 vn, and it is an equivalent condition. And that's why we can write the dual cone in the following way. It is the set of all y in Rg, such that y vi is smaller than zero for all i. Now, this inequality, just a single inequality of this type, defines a half space whose boundary is passing through the origin, a closed half space with boundary passing through the origin. And so the dual is then defined as the intersection of finitely many such half spaces. And this is another definition of cones. So we can could define a cone equivalent as an intersection of finitely many half spaces like, like here. Sorry, like here. Yeah. Now, um, some example of some examples of cones. The whole space, zero linear subspaces are cones. Now, something non-trivial or less trivial is the positive orthant. So it's the set of all points, all of coordinates, with, with all coordinates positive, or some, any, or any sets defined by finitely many linear inequalities, something like that, for example, is a cone. It's called a wild chamber. So a set given by, by these inequalities. And now for cones, it is possible to define the notion of conic intrinsic volumes. Um, this is done as follows. First of all, we need to define the notion of metric projection. So let C in Rg be a polyhedral cone or yeah, a cone. Then for any point x in Rd, which is may maybe in C or maybe outside of C, the metric projection of x on C is defined as the minimizer of the distance to x in C. So this is called the metric projection. And since 
cone is a convex set, it is defined uniquely. It's easy to show that it is defined uniquely. And it looks as follows. If this angle is our cone C, then the dual cone is this one. So this is C dual. And now we can define the metric projection. If a point X is somewhere here, then it is projected just in this way. So these points are projected to this side of the cone. The points which are here are projected to this side of the cone. The point, points which are inside C are projected to itself. Because then the optimizer is the point itself. And finally, the points which are here in the dual cone are all projected to the origin. So we see that each point is projected to some face of C, which may be C itself, or it may be this one dimensional face, or it may be this zero dimensional face. And now the conic intrinsic volumes of a cone are quantities which compute the, or which give the probabilities that a point is projected to a k dimensional face. Namely, here is the definition for all k in zero d. Define the k conic intrinsic volume as follows. Of C as follows. It is, um, it is noted by VK of C and it is the probability that the metric projection of a random vector G is contained in the relative interior of some k-dimensional phase of C. Relative interior means that it is contained in this phase, but not in a phase of small di dimension. And here, G is just uh, any random vector with a, with a rotational invariant distribution. For example, it may be the Gaussian distribution or any other rotational invariant distribution, for example, the uniform distribution on the sphere, on the unit sphere there. So we just take the um, proportion of all vectors which are project of all directions which are projected to k-dimensional phases, and this is called the k-dimension, the case intrinsic volume. For example, in this case, for this cone C, the first intrinsic volume V1 is going to be one half because we have here together 180 degrees. So the, these two angles together give 180 degrees. And the probability that a vector, a random direction is here is one half. Now, some properties of the conic intrinsic volumes. Um, First of all, the sum of these quantities is one. A from zero to D. This follows, follows from the definition because these are probabilities and every vector is projected to some phase. So this is one, but there is a less straightforward property. The sum of all even indexed volumes as well as the sum of all odd indexed volumes is one half. So let me write it in this way alternating sum is zero over all k, uh, but this doesn't hold the only exception is for this is c is not li a linear subspace. Because for linear subspaces, it's clearly not true. Now, uh, there is also a more explicit definition of the conic intrinsic volumes, and we shall need it in a moment. So, explicit formula for K is as follows the K conic intrinsic volume of C is given as a sum of overall K dimensional faces 
of C. And then we have to compute the probability that some vector, that a, that a vector, say, uniformly distributed on the sphere, is projected to the relative interior of this phase. So let us imagine that we have a cone in a four-dimensional space. Here is a phase F, which is two-dimensional, and we are, say, in R4. Then under, and, and the cone is somewhere here. Then under which conditions a point is projected to this phase? One can write it down explicitly. Namely, one can define the normal phase of F as follows. It is N of F inside C, and it is defined as the corresponding phase of the dual cone, because there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the phases of the usual cone and the phase of the dual cone. Namely, it is given as follows. We take the dual cone and we intersect it with the orthogonal complement of the linear how of f. So we take the linear half how, how of f, which is two-dimensional in this case, because it is a two-dimensional plane in this case. And then we take the complement, which is in this example also two-dimensional, and we intersect it with the dual cone, and we get a two-dimensional phase of the dual cone. So it is somewhere, somewhere here. We have orthogonally to that, we have a two-dimensional phase of the dual cone. It's um, it is n of f c, and here we have our cone c. And the dual cone, it's, well, it's difficult to tell where the dual cone is, but it is a phase of the dual cone. So it's normal phase. And now it is possible to check that a point x in Rd, in R4 in this case, is projected to f if and only if it is in the direct product, if and only if it is here in the direct product of the phase and its normal. So, um, P C of X belongs to F if and only if X is in F direct orthogonal sum because they are orthogonal with the normal phase. And the probability of this event can be computed. It is the probability, it is the angle of the phase F multiplied by uh, multiplied by the angle of the normal phase. So it is alpha of f multiplied by the alpha of the normal phase of f. And alpha is the solid angle of the phase. So the solid angle is defined as the probability that a vector u, which is uniform on the unit sphere intersected with the linear hull of f. So it is a random vector which is uniform on the unit sphere in the linear linear hull of f belongs to f. And it is between zero and one in this normalization. And this here is the formula for the kth intrinsic volume in terms of angles of the faces and angles of the dual faces. And now the basic fact, which is very useful about the conic intrinsic volumes, is that they participate in the so-called conic Crofton formula. So it's, it's not, not a Crofton formula, it's a conic Crofton formula. And it states the following. Suppose we have a cone C and we want to compute the probability that this cone is intersected by a random subspace of co-dimension J. So this L is a random subspace, random linear subspace of co-dimension J in Rd. It is uniformly distributed on the set of all such subspaces. And we are interested in the probability that it is not zero, that this intersection is non-trivial. Then the conic crofton formula says that this is given as two times the following half-tail functional of the intrinsic volumes. 
So we start with j plus one, j is the code I mentioned, plus j plus three, plus j plus five of c plus and so on. And at some point it becomes zero after, if, 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 this, is, if this index is greater than d, then it becomes zero. So this is a basic formula in, in which these conic intrinsic volumes appear. And one can, and it holds if C is not a linear subspace. And it is also possible to write down a formula for the complementary event, namely the probability that C intersected with L D minus J is zero, so the probability of trivial intersection is one minus this probability. But since the sum of all volumes, of all intrinsic volumes with odd indices is equal to one half, and the sum of all intrinsic volumes with even indices is also equal to one half, we can write it as follows. It is two times, so actually it is one minus that probability, but we can write it using these two identities these two, we can write it as the lower, as, as a sort of distribution function or, the, or half, half distribution function of these. So if it's v of j minus one of c plus v of j minus three of c plus v of j minus five of c plus and so on. And now, uh, one example where this formula can be used is a formula of Affentrane and Schneider, which I'm going to state now. Okay, we, we, should, we can do it on the same page. So it's an example of a application of, of this Crofton formula. And the problem which we would like to solve is the following one. Suppose we have a polytop P in the n-dimensional space. P is now in the n-dimensional space, a polytop. And we and assume it, 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 it is a full dimension, just for simplicity. And let L be a uniformly distributed random subspace, random linear subspace of dimension D in Rn, of course. So it's everything is in Rn now. And we want to project this polytop P to L. So we denote by pi from Rn to L the orthogonal projection on this random linear subspace. So we take a polytop P and project it in, in a random way on a d-dimensional subspace. The question is, what is the expected number of k-dimensional faces of this projection? And the formula of Affentrang and Schneider allows to answer this question in terms of angles of the polytop P, as we shall see in a moment. So here is the solution. Well, um, sorry. So we look at the expected number of faces, a dimensional faces of the projection of P. So we project P to a random subspace. And we can write it as follows. First of all, the faces of the projection, the projection is also a polytop, and the faces of the projection come from the faces of the original polytop of the same dimension. This is maybe not, not so easy to show rigorously, but it's true. And that's why we can write it as the, as the expectation of the sum over all faces of the original polytop of k of p. And then we take the indicator function of the event that pi f is a face of ip. So we take 
the sum over all phases of the original polytope, and we project, we take the projections of these phases, and some of them are phases of the project polytope, but not all of them. And that's why we have the indicator function here. Now we can interchange the expectation and the sum, and then we get here the sum over all f in fk of p of the probability that pi f is a phase of pi p. So this is the probability that a phase is preserved under projection. For example, on this picture, we have here this phase, which is not preserved under projection. It becomes, it, it is in the, it is an inner point of the projection. So these two phases, this one and this one are not preserved. Whereas these phases are preserved. And now what is the condition that a phase is preserved? Maybe in order to see it, let us look at the special case where we have uh, where we have a vertex and we want to know whether a vertex is preserved. Like here. Well, these two vertices are destroyed under projection because the direction in which we project intersects the polytop. And by the way, the same holds for this vertex. It is also destroyed under projection because the direction in which we project intersects the tangent cone at this phase, at this vertex. And this is a general statement, namely for a phase to be preserved, it is necessary and sufficient that the tangent cone is not intersected by the direction in which we project. And the direction in which we project is the orthogonal space to L. So, um, so we can write it as the sum over all faces in Fk of P, k-dimensional faces of the probability that the tangent cone of F in the polytop P is not intersected by the direction in which we project. So the intersection should be trivial, it should be zero. Zero because the tangent cone is something which is, it is, it is something like say, the tangent cone of this is, is this angle, but it is shifted to zero by definition. And the orthogonal complement is also shifted to zero. So we, we want to have this. And now this holds just for every subspace L, well, in, in general position, it's not, we have to exclude some cases where it's not in general position, but since we are dealing with random uniform subspaces, this is not a problem here. And at this point we can use the Crofton formula. So this is by the, by the conic Crofton formula, the sum over all faces of P for all k-dimensional phases of P. And then we take the sum over all A equals one, three, five, and so on. And we take V D minus L of the tangent cone of F in P. This is the, <clears throat> this is the conic Crofton formula applied to compute this probability, right? It's just, the, the tangent cone is some cone and we don't want it to be intersected. And that's why we have the sum of conic intrinsic volumes of this tangent cone. And now it is possible to write down this, these conic intrinsic volumes explicitly. So we have here F in Fk of P, and then we have the sum over all L plus one, three, five, and so on. And now it is possible to compute these conic intrinsic volumes explicitly. To this end, we need to imagine the tangent columns. Um, well, so what is the conic intrinsic volume of a tangent cone? Suppose, for example, that our face is just a vertex. And then we have some edges from this vertex and the tangent cone is then something which is, which is inside here, right? Inside this cone. Now, what is the uh, D minus L intrinsic volume? I have to take a sum, but now I, I want to use this, this explicit formula, this one. So we have to sum over all D minus L dimensional faces of the tangent cone. And what are the D minus L dimensional faces of the tangent cone? 
they correspond to all d minus l dimensional faces of the polyet of which contain our face f. So here is f, here is our face f. And if I want to have a face of the tangent cone, for example, a two dimensional one, then I need, I need a two dimensional face of p that contains f. So we have to take a sum over all faces g in dimension d minus l because we are interested in the d minus l intrinsic volume and overall but overall such j which contain f so f should be f should be a subset of g and such faces g correspond by jack in, in a bijective way to the faces of the to the d minus l dimensional faces of the tangent cone now what is the angle of the of the of the um, of the tangent cone of the face of the tangent cone corresponding to this g it's just in on this picture it's just it's just this i'm sorry it's just this angle these angles right and they are called the internal angles of the face so they are called b of f inside the face g and roughly speaking uh, I, I think I, I already defined something like this but roughly speaking this is the following thing we take some point in the relative interior of f and we look in all directions from this point and those directions which show inside g are counted and the probability is is this one we look in all possible directions of course only those ones which are in the linear how of g and now uh, we have uh, this this is the angle of the face of the tangent cone but then we also have to multiply by the angle of the dual cone or by the angle of the corresponding face of the dual cone and it is it is called gamma of jp and gamma of jp is the external angle of j in p so what does this mean we take j uh, we, we take g it's a face of p then we take the tangent cone of g the tangent cone of g inside p and take the dual one so this is not not so easy to to show on the picture mm, but okay so this is not easy to show on the picture one it's it's something one have one has to think about and so uh, here now now we have the formula this is the formula which i think and schneider derived and it expresses the expected number of faces of the projected polytope under such a random projection in terms of the internal angles of well inside some phases of the polytope and external angles of the faces of the polytope so here, just for completeness here, beta of Fg is the angle, the solid angle of the tangent cone of F inside G and gamma of Fg is the angle of the, is the angle of, of the tangent cone of, of the dual of the tangent cone of G and P. So, this is the formula and for example using this formula it's very easy to derive the number of um, the expected number of phases for random projections of the cube because in the cube it's very easy to compute all these angles they are just uh, essentially they are right angles everywhere and it's easy to, to compute them and one gets the expected number of, of phases in a random projection of a cube an interesting thing of the cube is that in fact it's not only the expected number but it's also the almost sure number so one can show that for for the cube any projection which is in general position has the same number of k-dimensional phases and this number can be derived by this formula and it's also possible to do it to, to apply it for example to the random simplex then one gets which was the original example considered by Frank and schneider so then it computes the number of k-dimensional phases in the projection of a simplex in terms of the angles of, of the 
of the simplex. If, if the simplex is regular, then these are the eigens of the regular simplex, for example. And now let us apply this formula to beta polytops. Let us apply it to beta polytops. I'm sorry. Yes. And what I'm now talking about is based on a joint work with Christoph Thiele and Dmitry Zaporozhets. So our goal will be to reduce the computation of the expected number of phases of the beta polytope to the computation of certain random angles. The computation of the random angles is another problem which we will not be able to solve in this lecture. So let us consider the beta polytope. So application or special case. Special case. Beta polytops. And the same can be done for beta prime polytops. Now, the beta polytop is not a projection. It is not defined as a random projection, but we can do the following. Suppose here we have a linear, we have a Euclidean space of dimension D. And in this space, we construct a beta polytop by taking n points according to the, they are called x1, xn, according to the probability density fdb, so according to the beta distribution. In, in fact, they are all inside the wall. And now let us represent this polytope. I call it just p for simplicity. This is a beta polytope. Let us represent it as a random projection of something which is simpler. Namely, let us consider here above this space and a space which is n minus one dimensional. Usually n, the number of points, is of course greater than d. So we can assume here n is greater than d, or maybe even greater than d plus one, so that it's full dimensional. And now let us consider a space r n minus one, which has larger dimension. And in this space of larger dimension, we take n points, the same number. Here we have n points, so say seven. And here we have also endpoints, but now they are in three positions here. They are in general position. They form a simplex. So here we also take endpoints. And as a distribution of these points, which are called y1, yn, we take again a beta distribution in the space of dimension n minus one, but with parameter beta, which is chosen in such a way that under projection, this parameter beta is projected to that parameter beta. Remember that beta distributions are projection invariant. So if we take this beta distribution and project it to a space of lower dimension, then we get another beta distribution with a parameter beta which is larger. And I take the parameter such that this projection corresponds to that. And then we can assume that these x1, xn are just projections of y1, yn. So we take here a projection, call it pi, and xi are the projections of yi. Now we can also take this projection to be uniform, actually. We can do the following. We can take this rn minus one and take this rd to be a random uniformly distributed subspace there. And let pi be such a random projection. This can also be done because this random rotation of the, of the space rd inside of rn minus one doesn't change the beta distribution, it's isotropic. So P can be thought of a uniform random projection if, if we like it, nothing changes. And now we have represented the beta polytope as a projection of the beta simplex because what we have seen here is a random simplex generated by endpoints with the beta distribution. There is here one um, thing which we have to take care of Namely, if beta is sufficiently small, say minus one, this is the smallest value, then this is smaller than this, than, than minus one, and it's not admissible. So the method would work only for beta which are sufficiently large. But then we can do analytic continuation of co-quantities. So just for, as, as, as a remark, this works if beta is sufficiently large, and, but the formula holds by analytic continuation everywhere. Now let us, compute the number of phases of this beta polytope. Now it is a projection. And, which, and, and that's why we can apply the formula of Raffenhagen-Schneider. 
So we want to compute, sorry. We want to compute, we want to compute the number of faces of the polytop P. P is the projection and let, let me call this polytop in the higher dimensional space Q. So it's Q. And let us do the following. Let us first condition on Q. So we condition on Q, Q is given. It's just some simplex, the mystic one. And what is random is the projection. So this P is the projection of Q and the projection is random. Then we can apply the formula because it's exactly the setting in, in, in which it applies. And it says us that we have to take two times the sum over all L from one, three, five, and so on. We have to take the sum over all G. I interchange the summation here a little bit from F D minus L of, uh, of Q. And then we have to take the external angle of G at, in Q and multiply it by the sum over all F in FK of G and take here the internal angle of F inside G. So we have to take such a sum. It's just the formula, the same formula with sums interchange. Now we can also integrate over Q. And if we integrate over Q, we get, we take the expectation over Q, then we get the expected number of faces of P, which is now a beta polytop. And it is given as follows. It is two times the sum over L. Here we cannot do anything. Then we have the sum over all G. G is a face of Q and Q is a simplex now. Q is a simplex. So any subset of vertices of a given size of a size G minus L plus one defines a face. So we have to take the factor and choose D minus L plus one, which is the number of D minus L dimensional phases of Q. And then we can take just some fixed phase. For example, let G be the face y1 and so on y d minus l plus one the simplest one the convex hull of them and then we have what, what do we have we have to take the expectation right this is the expectation which is taken with respect to the randomness in this q q was random remember q is a random beta simplex that's why we have to take expectation with respect to this Q of the following quantity of gamma of G inside Q times the sum of beta of F inside G. And F is the sum of all faces inside of all faces of G of dimension K. And now this applies, what we have done applies actually to everything. It applies to any projection of any random polytop. But something special about beta polytops comes here. Here we have a, the expectation of a product of gamma times beta. And now Q is a simplex, as is a random simplex. G is some fixed phase of this simplex, say generated by the first minus L plus one vertices. And then we have here some functional inside G. This is something which is internal for G. It's the sum of angles of G at all phases of dimension K. And now remember that for beta polytops, we proved the following thing. We proved, and this applies also to beta simplices. This applies to Q. Q is a beta simplex. And we proved the following property. We prove that if we take some vertices, in this case, these are the vertices which span G, then the shape of G up to scaling is independent. So remember, we scaled this G such that it, it somehow becomes in the, we scale it some, such that the linear, the ball, which is obtained by intersecting the linear hull of G with the unit ball becomes the unit ball of, of, the, of the same dimension as G. 
so but but this doesn't influence the angles so this the angles the sum of angles of g at its k dimensional phases doesn't change under the scaling and that's why this internal characteristic of g is independent of the tangent cone of g so here we have it's difficult to to draw now because g is now two uh, two dimensional so but it has a tangent cone there and we proved that the tangent cone is independent of the internal properties of g invariant on the scaling which means that this angle gamma which is just the normal angle of the tangent cone it's just the angle of the dual cone of the tangent cone is stochastically independent of this sum of betas so this is the crucial fact they are independent and that's why we can write the expectation as a product. And here we used that we are dealing with beta polytops. So we have here two times the sum, L equals one, three, five, and so on, of the binomial coefficients times the expectation of gamma. Yes, times the expectation of gamma of the external angle multiplied by the expectation of the internal angle sum. But in fact, we just can take one angle here because all of them are have the same distribution. So let, let me write the sum, but the sum doesn't play any role. So it's f in fk of g, and here we have the internal angles. And now we reduce the problem of the computation of this vector to the following one. So the remaining problem is compute the expected number of the expected internal angle and the expected external angle in a random simplex. So suppose that y1, yn are form a beta simplex in the n minus one dimensional space with parameter gamma. And then we need to compute two sorts of quantities. The first quantity is the expected internal angle at some phase, say y1, yk, inside y1, yn. And the second problem is to compute the external angle, y1, yk inside y1 yn where y1 yn is a beta simplex now maybe you remember that this g the distribution of this g was not exactly the distribution of the beta simplex it was these points were not beta distributed they had some dependence inside but this dependence can be removed by additional arguments. In fact, this doesn't change the angle sum. So such a dependence doesn't change the angle sum. So we need to compute these two sorts of angles. So for example, the problem reduces to the simplest special case of this problem is the following one. Take a sphere, S2, take four points there. They span a tetrahedron on the sphere, say uniformly, and compute the expected sum of angles of this of this tetrahedron at vertices. And it would be a topic for a next lecture or even two, how to compute these external and internal angles. There are now explicit formulas available. So can be derived. And for example, here in this special case, the sum is equal to one eighth. So the expected sum is one eighth of the full solid angle. I think we have exactly 45 minutes and we can stop here. Thank you for your attention.